It's a great delight to see you all, many familiar faces. Thank you all for coming and to see our panelists, uh, many of whom have been my colleagues for many years. Let me introduce them. Uh, at the far end of the table is Professor Frank Sisson. He's the director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And he's a professor in the Department of History and Classics at the University of Alberta and editor-in-chief of the Khrushchevsky Translation Project which is an English translation of the multi-volume History of Ukraine Rus by the great Ukrainian historian Mikhail Kruchevsky. Um, and he's also a member of the executive committee of a newly established Holodomor Research and Education Consortium at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And his work on the Kruchevsky collection is in Toronto. He's a specialist in Ukrainian and Polish early modern history. We were in graduate school together. He's the author of Between Poland and Ukraine, The Dilemma of Adam Kisil, 1600-1653, and the author of Mihailo Kruszewski, Historian and National Awakener, and other many uh, studies of the Helnitsky um, Revolution, Ukrainian historiography, and other early modern topics, including, and also, the Holodomor. And then, in the middle, is our Professor Norman Neymark of the Department of Hes History here at Stanford. He's the Robert and Florence McDonald Professor of East European Studies in the History Department. He's also the William and Sakurako Fisher Family Director of the Division of International Comparative and Area Studies, ICA, which is um, an organization overseeing area studies centers such as CREES. Um, he's very prolific. His most recent books include Stalin's Genocides, and he's recently co-edited a Question of Genocide, Armenians and Turks at the End of the Ottoman Empire. And he's presently at work on a book for Oxford University Press, A World History of Genocide, and a book on Stalin's policies in Europe after World War II. And finally, right next to me here to my left, is Professor Amir Weiner, also of the Department of History here at Stanford. His research concerns Soviet history, with an emphasis on the interaction between totalitarian politics, ideology, nationality, and society. His first book was called Making Sense of War, and it analyzed the role and impact of the cataclysm of the Second World War on Soviet society and politics, and it was centered around the Ukrainian case study. His current project, Wild West, Window to the West, engages the territories between the Baltic and the Black Seas annexed by the Soviet Union 39 to 40, from that initial occupation to the present. And Professor Viner will chair and moderate our panel and the subsequent discussion. So I will turn this over to him now. Thank you, Nancy. We will start uh, with Professor Sissi. Thank you. Uh, there is a handout. If anyone doesn't have it, here are more copies of it. Please pass that out. Uh, as I think it was clear from Professor Coleman's introduction, my, uh, most of my scholarly work deals with periods long before the Holodomor, uh, early modern Ukraine, uh, late 19th century. Uh, and in this way, uh, when I am dealing with the topic today, I will take the liberty of at times being a witness and autobiographical, not of the events themselves, but of the study of those events. And as many of my professors at Harvard love to begin their talks with the appropriately pretentious Latin phrase, I will say that habent sua fata libendi is the catchword of the day. That is not the way it is usually misquoted from Terentianius Maus as meaning that books have the story of how they were written, but rather as it properly should be quoted, pro captu lectores habent sua fata libendi. Books have their fates according to their reader's capacity. And much of my talk today will deal with how books have been received and how important it is how they are presented and what, at what state the public and reader is at the time they are produced. Now the first of these books I will deal with is a book titled The Black Deeds of the Kremlin, a white book. This is the second of two books that came out in 1953 and 1955. And this volume two, is entitled The Great Famine in Ukraine in 1932-33. Now what these two books were, 
were uh, hundreds of eyewitness testimonies, and as well as writings by intellectuals who had left the Soviet Union at the end of World War II and emigrated to North America. As I said, the first book came out in Toronto and published by an organization called Suzero, the Ukrainian Association of Victims of Russian Communist Terror. And the second volume, which came out in Detroit uh, by, the, by uh, Dobrus, was the Democratic Organization of Ukrainians Formerly Persecuted by the Soviet Regime. And it was these groups that gathered together uh, in these years, largely under the organization of uh, an editorial board headed by Mr. Pete Heine, uh, and produced these volumes in English. I might add the, uh, the copy editing was done by George Lutsky. I find almost every topic and thesis that is still discussed in discussing the Ukrainian famine is dealt with in this book. That is, one finds in headings of these short fragments titles such as The Warehouses of Grain Collection Trust Filled with Grain, Famine Among Workers in Poltava, Children Help Parents to Survive, How They Save People from Starving, a story that shows uh, that some communists did help people, No Famine for Soviet Hogs, showing how livestock was fed, A Jewish Doctor Helps the Starving, telling about his particular doctor in the hospital in Chanyuki, Our Cow Saved Our Family from Starving to Death, People dying in their grain elevators, and on and on the topics went. Molotov orders starvation. There are endless eyewitness testimony of the social history of the famine as told by, and I didn't count up uh, 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 how many, but let us say hundred and maybe hundreds of people who had survived these events, all of whom uh, were negative towards those who had carried on the famine. Many of them negative, as I said, towards the communist rule, as you can tell from the organizations. And yet, on the other hand, the, the uh, volume contains testimony of those who will even tell you about good communists and those who, who saved them in this. And putting forth many of the theses that were debated for the next 60 years on the famine, including issues such as the closing of the Ukrainian borders, the not permitting people to take trains out of Ukraine, uh, the uh, the attempts to keep people from getting to the grain that was gathered together on, on these collectives. That is, I would say, it is a remarkably rich volume. It also has uh, an introduction written by a man named Ivan Dubinet Dubinet. He regrettably died in 1954, rather mysteriously, in New York. And as you can guess with most emigre circles, people who die in their apartments of the gas leak, uh, there are often questions of how he met his death. And in this introduction, he uh, discusses the statistical uh, data on how many people died in the famine and comes up with a figure of 4.8 million. I might add that these figures were debated for many, many years thereafter, and we are now at largely around 4 million in current, current demographic data. Of course, they didn't have in, in emigration anything like the data that we have. The other thing this book presented, which was really a rarity, was these groups had brought out local newspapers from the Soviet Union. You couldn't get local newspapers from the Soviet Union. So they translate accounts from the press of 1932, 33, 34, and put it in this volume. Uh, now, I said that there are issues of reception. And here I said I would be autobiographical. Uh, first, I should say that uh, um, I think I had two major political events of, let's say, my or late childhood, early teenage years. The first that I can vividly remember is 1956, when in the age of nine, the Hungarian Revolution took place. And the reason I can remember it so well in my own biography is I was allowed to stay up all night as everyone gathered around the radio. And uh, great hopes by the largely refugee groups that were in my East European neighborhood that this was it. This was the beginning of the rollback. And even the next day, going to the Hungarian neighbors, uh, and people saying, you, you may be going home yet. And home was still there. And so it's a memory that remains to me this, to this day. And the second is the black beads of the Kremlin. My friend, Theophil, had to practice the piano. And, and his parents had these two volumes on a bookshelf on the porch of their house. And when I, he was practicing, and I was a little early, I would, I guess now at the age of 11, maybe would be picking up these books and reading the accounts 
of the starvations, of the cannibalisms, of all of these things that are covered in these volumes. And therefore, it imprinted it very much on my memory. Indeed, I can remember asking my father, who was a, uh, an American GI of Ukrainian background and been in Western Europe, was this true? And he, and he, of course, said, of course it's true. And not only that, my greatest shame as an American was that we gave many of these people back to the Soviets. Uh, so that these things remained in my memory and placed me on a certain political spectrum when we talk about how people develop and how they become academics. We all are, after all, subjects of our past. And so the black deeds of the Kremlin remained in my memory. And certainly when I arrived at Princeton as an undergraduate and found that the courses, and there was no Soviet history in the 1960s, there was only Soviet politics, that the famine was virtually unmentioned in these kind of courses at that time and certainly put me on a different level than, uh, of interest than my professors then. Now the next book I want to deal with is one close to home, with the Hoover Tower so close. That is Robert Conquest's Harvest of Sorrow, a book that came out in 1986, uh, a book that was reviewed with scores of reviews in every major news journal, Time, London Review of Books, New York Review of Books, and made at the time a, a tremendous impression and started many, many scholarly debates and in many ways can be argued to be the beginning of the uh, academic serious study of the famine. And that is, the, I don't say that nothing was done before the 80s, but relatively little had been done. And not only I say that, as great an authority on Soviet agricultural life as R. W. Davies, uh, said that most Western accounts of Soviet development had treated the famine of 1932-33 as a secondary event, although he maintained that it should occupy a central place in the history of the Soviet Union, and he wrote that in 1987 in response to Conquest book. So I just want to give the feeling of what that book did for a profession and what the profession said at that time. Now, we've got to go back to the 1980s. From 1933, to the 1980s, the Soviet Union denied that a famine had occurred. And, and we must, for those of you younger, you must get back to that period in time. For example, uh, on the 28th of April, 1983, the Soviet embassy in Ottawa issued a press release on the so-called famine in Ukraine, uh, which admitted to only some difficulties due to drought and kulak sabotage as having occurred at this period. Uh, the Soviet representatives denied that there had been draconian grain requisitions or any decline in total population in 1932-33. And they argued that these were slanders from emigrants, organizations, and their leaders, some of whom, according to the Soviet news release, had actively supported Nazi atrocities. So this is the state of what the Soviet authorities said publicly in the early 1980s, just as Conquest's book is coming out. Uh, and I might add, the history of Conquest's book, and he could say much more about it, is quite interesting, uh, because it came out of a project at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard. Uh, and here I was a witness. That is, I, it was not what I was working on, but I was at the meetings as all of this was being discussed, how the project would be done. It began largely because so one of our fundraisers' family had suffered in, in, in the famine. It wasn't called below the more yet at this point and uh, had put forth this idea in the late 1970s. Uh, this then was discussed, and Harvard was particularly a favorable place to do this because of the constellation of professors Pipes and Ulam and others, who in the world of Sovietology of those days would be viewed as on the right of the, of the, of the perspective, and therefore as emigres as well from largely Poland, uh, that was a, we had Professor Victor Weintraub as well, and they were well aware of what had happened, that, what, that the famine had happened, and were favorably disposed to the project. And uh, I believe, and when we checking the documentation, that it was Adam Ulam who proposed uh, approaching Robert Conquest to write this study. And out of this came the Harvest of Sorrow. Uh, James Mace was employed by the Harvard Institute as a background person. Many people at the Institute gathered material, uh, and of course, this network, wider network that the Institute could draw in, drew in then survivors and other groups who could send in material. Now, I was present in Cambridge, and I will check the date after this talk someday, I, but I have some documentary evidence. 
when the U Ukrainian UN mission came in delegation to the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, uh, and they uh, told the, the then director, uh, Omoyan Fritzak, uh, the associate director Igor Shevchenko, and the assembled staff, that if the institute undertook this project, no one associated with the institute would ever be allowed any access to Soviet archives at all. Uh, and later they published a rather uh, uh, nasty denunciation of Professor Fritzak, by the way, a specialist, as many of you know, in medieval and even antique history, uh, uh, and a well-renowned scholar uh, as uh, being a fraud. Uh, they attacked James Mace. They described the people of the Institute as lackeys of the imperialist reactionary circles. Uh, and these enunciations came largely in the publications that were aimed at the Ukrainian emigration in English. These were published in Kiev at this time. So what I, what I need, to say in this, and need to say in this is that indeed uh, it took a certain amount of at least minimal courage to continue this. Remember, in those days, if you were not allowed into the Soviet Union for archival material, you often couldn't get a job later on. So that what the professors were in fact doing is potentially, and by the way, and I, I am one of these people who was not allowed in, so I can tell you, fortunately, I had Polish libraries and archives and I did manage to get a job, but it was at that very same institute. So this was a real threat then to academic enterprise of what you're doing. Now, Conquest Book, uh, I think much is known about it and I won't repeat about what, what it said at that point, what was said later on it. Uh, just quickly say that, that uh, Conquest blamed Stalin's regime for requiring impossible grain requisitions, ignoring reports of famine, refusing to release confiscated gain even as, grain even as the peasantry starved, exporting grain, <laughs> rejecting foreign attempts to assist the starving, and forbidding the very mention of the word famine. He came up with a statistic of five million dying in Ukraine at this time. There was much discussion of this statistic. Uh, and uh, said there was a general Soviet famine that perhaps took seven million people but the majority of these were in Ukraine and as well as in the Kuban region where there was a considerable Ukrainian population. And then put the word genocide into the discussion. Uh, now, how was that book received? I discussed all of the reviews that went on everywhere, but I think I'll, I'll give the voice to a, a very good historian, Jeffrey Hosking. How did he receive Conquest's book? He said, almost unbelievably, Dr. Conquest's book is the first historical study of what must count as one of the greatest man-made horrors of the century, particularly full of them. E. H. Carr used to assert that the history of the Soviet Union after about 1930 probably could not be adequately written because of the paucity of reliable sources. I had always assumed that this warning applied particularly to the collectivization and especially to the famine. It therefore comes to, uh, as a shock to discover just how much material had accumulated over the years most of it perfectly accessible in British libraries. All right, what did Peter Wiles, prominent economic historian, say about this? He announced he was convinced of by conquest argumentation and admitted, admitted that he'd always been too deterred by the title to examine the evidence in the black deeds of the Kremlin. All right. Now, other reviewers questioned about the targeting of Ukraine, and particularly was questioned was the decision with the closing of the borders, not allowing people out of Ukraine, in which the Black Deeds has much of the discussion. Others, on the other end of the political perspective, and particularly J. Arch Getty, came down rather hard on Conquest's book. He described uh, this book as, in negative terms, uh, for having accepted the intentional famine story, an article of faith for Ukrainian emigres in the West since the Cold War. Please remember that timing, since the Cold War. And then he dismissed the black deeds of the Kremlin and other books of the early 1980s as period pieces, and then went on to, to uh, argue against Conquest's argumentation on that. Indeed, the New York Times uh, review of Conquest's book uh, had uh, objected to Conquest's use of Ukrainian emigre sources with their emotional titles. In response, Conquest published in the 30th of November 1986 issue of the New York Times that the unthinking rejection of books with such titles is only a cultural prejudice. Now remember, in 1985-6, there was no access to Soviet archives and materials for this kind of topic, and there was certainly no access to all of the survivors who did exist in Ukraine at that time. There were, of course, a much greater number at that period. 
Okay, and then my third book. My third book is a book by Douglas Cottle, published in 1987 in the city of Toronto by Progress Publishers. The book was called Fraud, Famine, and Fascism, the Ukrainian Genocide Myth from Hitler to Harvard. Uh, this book, we now argue, admitted by 1987 that there had been a famine and possibly thousands of people had died. The famine was due to drought and to kulak sabotage. Now, I might add, we now know much more about Tadl's book than we knew earlier. Uh, this is, uh, in practice, uh, what we now know is the book was prepared in Kiev. It was offered to be, it was not written by Mr. Tadl, who is no longer with us now, who knew no Slavic language, as I might add. Uh, he, the book was first put out to be published by the Ukrainian communist organizations in Canada, and they refused in 1987 to publish it, and Tadl's book was published. I might add, it became a centerpiece in a Village Voice article uh, by Jeff Coughlin, which attacked the entire famine enterprise uh, and used Tadl's book, and then went on to say, uh, in assembling statements, and by the way, there were no letters from these people that ever negated saying this, so I have to accept that they accepted it, that a rather prominent uh, specialist of the Soviet peasantry, Moshe Lewin, said, this is crap rubbish and I am an anti-Stalinist, but I don't see how this campaign, genocide campaign, adds to our knowledge. And Roberta Manning of Boston College uh, argued that James Mace uh, uh, was basically a hack. She said, I doubt we could have gotten a real academic job. Soviet studies is a very competitive field these days. There's much weeding out, uh, out after the PhD. If he hadn't hopped on this political cause, he would be doing research for a bank or running an export-import business. Now, by the way, James Bates had already written quite a good book on national communism in the 1920s, uh, and uh, Roberta Manning had at that point not written anything as substantial on the Soviet Union. Okay, now that's Toddle's book, and now on to uh, the book uh, that I would like to as well bring out today. Uh, our institute has just published a book called The Whole of the More Reader. Uh, it is selections of documents, uh, scholarly articles, legal assessments, literary works. Uh, and what I find is, to me, of interest is this book could not have been written 20 years ago. That is, you could not have made selections. You may make other selections. I do not say this has to be your choice of selections. You might be able to put together another such reader, but you couldn't have put together one 20 to 25 years ago. So academia eventually did pick up this topic and did take up this topic. There continue to be many debates, uh, and you need not take any of the issues put forth by these emigrant communities. Uh, there, there are now very interesting debates as to when the famine, uh, famine issue arose and became an important issue, and when this national interpretation of the famine came forth. Uh, a young historian in Sweden, Per Rudling, has just written a piece on the whole of the war, in which he argues that even in the diaspora, which was dominated by Western Ukrainians, there was little knowledge of the famine until the 1970s. And then argues that it was in 1982-83, in time for the 50th anniversary of the famine, the diaspora academics published a nationalist activist launched a major effort to produce a new math national mythology centered on the 1932-33 famine. Diaspora academics referred to the famine as a deliberate genocide in which Western states were complicit. Now, I don't argue one can take his interpretation or not, but I do argue that it didn't happen in the 1980s. Uh, that is, this happened a long period before the 1980s, uh, and uh, as my proof of it for the day, and the final part of the autobiography part, you have an article republished in the Ukrainian daily Svoboda in 1935 from the Passaic Herald News, the make paper of record in my area of New Jersey, written by my uncle, uh, who, I, who I argue was very, a very Western Ukrainian coming from the Carpathian Mountains. And you will find, if you read through this text, almost every component of the national interpretation of the famine, that it was uh, a movement against all Ukrainian institutions that attacked the Ukrainian church, that attacked the Ukrainian intelligentsia, that it had been managed by the Soviet regime as an attack on the Ukrainian nation, that it attacked the Ukrainian communists, 
as well from Moscow point of view. Now, I frequently, my uncle lived a long, long time and I had many debates on history with him and I don't necessarily argue that all of his historical interpretations are correct. What I merely want to argue today is that this interpretation came very early and then tying it later to events of the 1980s or to the Cold War uh, is really then poor historical writing of people. They don't go back to check their sources in time. Uh, and I might add, I, I'm very curious about this text. He's no longer with me. It is my theory that this was not written by my uncle because, the, it, I mean, he, he was a dear man and he learned English relatively well, but he hadn't learned it to this point by 1935. And I think that these, these were disseminated in the Ukrainian immigration, and he succeeded in getting it into the newspaper, but I really have to look more into that before I decide that. And I've left aside, of course, more current discussions of these issues, and above all, this issue of genocide. I, I might add, in, in, I looked through the Black Keys of the time, in the early 1950s, genocide is not being used anywhere. That I, have, I didn't go page by page yet. Uh, but of course, uh, Norman is a much better specialist to bring us into the topic of genocide in the middle of the war. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move to Norman. Thank you. <coughs> well, it's nice to be here, and I'm glad you're all here, uh, too, to uh, share this uh, occasion with us. Uh, for me, it's a particular pleasure uh, to be at the podium with Frank, uh, who is an old friend and colleague, and who really uh, introduced me to Ukrainian history, and a particular kind of Ukrainian history, an important part of Ukrainian history, and that is its sort of multinational, but also transnational character. You know, Ukrainian history is not a narrow, inward-looking uh, narrative of Ukrainian people, but rather includes many others, you know, Poles, um, Jews, Russians, uh, that it's uh, Cossacks of various sorts. It's a, it's a wonderful melange of uh, fascinating national and uh, religious diversity. Uh, and I remember that well, and I've always appreciated Frank uh, for those uh, lessons that he continues uh, to teach us. Um, another thing I want to say before, before uh, sort of launching, as it were, into, into my talk is um, it's always useful for academics to, to take a pause before doing analytical work, especially when thinking about a, a commemoration of, uh, you know, 80 years of the Holodomor and remember the people who died. Uh, and the people who are not with us. There are not very many survivors. We had a conference up in Toronto and heard from one survivor there, but there's a reason there are not very many survivors. There were millions of people, obviously, who died, and even those who lived, um, you know, had suffered severe malnutrition and horrible health problems and couldn't have lived very long. I mean, those who lived must have been incredibly strong. And then we remember you know, those people who were in their families, uh, you know, who lost people uh, in, uh, in the whole of the war, and that's a very, you know, difficult thing, personal thing to have those kinds of memories and that kind of a, a history. So it's a, it's a very good thing uh, for us to uh, remember those who died, those who suffered, and those who survived and carried with them the memories uh, that they had to carry with them. So what I'd like to do tonight uh, actually is talk um, not so much about the genesis of this, uh, of the genocide question or problem. Uh, we can talk about that later. I don't want to talk about the definition of genocide tonight. I mean, that you, you can go on for forever and people are always uh, worried about that. I'm glad to talk about that if you wish to a question period. But rather what I'd like to do is talk about how, and I'm going to assume that most of us in this audience think that the Lodomor was genocide, and I'm just going to make that assumption. You probably wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't, didn't think that. Um, so what I want to do is talk about how the Holodomor, and studying Holodomor, uh, and I'm not an expert in, in Ukrainian history, but I came across it mostly uh, in terms of my studies of genocide. So I, I work mostly on the history of genocide these days and for the past dozen years or so. And then what I want to talk about is the relationship in some ways between thinking and understanding the Holodomor and 
thinking and, uh, and trying to understand what uh, genocide is about. So what I've done is put together a series of points here. Hopefully I'll get through them all. Frank was uh, mercifully uh, on time, and I will try to be on time uh, as well, so we'll have some a chance for uh, discussion. So I, I have here seven points, and we'll see if I can get through them all. Well, I will get through them all. I'll just kind of do it fast, right? So, first of all, the most obvious thing to say about the Holodomor is that it is a case of what should be classified as communist genocide. Uh, in other words, uh, it's a case that is also exists in, in Maoist China uh, and in Pol Pot's uh, Cambodia. Uh, during the Great Leap Forward and during the, during the, the rule uh, of the Khmer Rouge uh, in uh, Cambodia, 65 to 69. Uh, why do I say communist? Because it's communism is an ideology, a transformative ideology that you know makes possible genocidal situations. I mean that particular ideology then you know calls forth um, you know uh, uh, this notion of completely transforming society, turning it into something else, and using people uh, you know as a means to the end of this new uh, world. Now, one can read Marx and one can read Lenin and say, well, they too had this transformative uh, ideology. Uh, and they did. And in Marx, he talks about violence being the midwife of new societies. And of course, in Lenin, you can see a lot about the use of violence. But I would maintain that these communist societies are necessary but not sufficient for genocide. And what you need are these kinds of leaders that we have or that communism brings forth uh, and that is Stalin uh, as one, and Mao as another, and Pol Pot as a third, who are ready to go the extra step, in other words, to destroy large numbers of people in order to accomplish uh, what they want. In other words, it takes a particular kind of leader within the communist situation that makes possible this sort of complete disdain for human life and this readiness uh, 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 to destroy uh, uh, people. Um, I mean, the other thing about communism, of course, is its disdain for the peasantry. And that's important in all three cases, where in the Great Leap Forward, I mean, people think, uh, a man named Frank de Kutter has estimated that 45 million people uh, died in the Great Leap uh, Forward. I mean, the minimal estimate is about 35 million. And of course, in Pol Pot's Cambodia, you know, this transformation cost the life of about one-fifth uh, of, of the population. So for Mao, for Pol Pot, uh, for Stalin, peasants are what Mao called a transitional material. In other words, there's something that can be used, and there's something that can be destroyed in order to create a new world. So this is characteristic, then, of communist uh, genocide. More specifically, the Holodomor is a case of what I've called Stalin's genocides. I wrote a book uh, by that uh, title. In other words, it fully conformed with the way that Stalin uh, constructed a whole series of attacks during the 1930s, whether it was dekulakization, or attacks on nations, or attacks uh, on um, so-called asocial people, or attacks on political groupings, these fantastic political groupings which he put together in 37 and 38. <laughs> I mean, the case of the Ukrainian uh, killer famine of 32-33 was a similar kind of genocide. It fit this Stalinist mode by identifying uh, Ukrainian peasants as alleged, you know, kulaks, uh, ketyurites, counter-revolutionaries, uh, and so on. And Stalin imagined a fantastic plot, and it was a fantastic plot, like in all of these other cases, there was a fantastic plot in which uh, the grain delivery crisis would be used by uh, the Poles in particular, and that there would be Ukrainian uprisings as there were uh, during the Civil War, uh, and in uh, actually 1930 as well, and that there would be an attempt to prize loose Ukraine from the Soviet Union. We may lose Ukraine, St Stalin warned, um, Kavanovich 
uh, in uh, 1932. So, uh, so Stalin then uses uh, 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 these fictions uh, to then go after the Ukrainian greatness, and the Holodomor uh, was just one more of these uh, fictions. Third, uh, the Holodomor was a, ma a case of mass killing by starvation. As I said, like the Great Leap Forward, like uh, Pol Pot's um, uh, uh, purposeful use of food, food deprivation to kill his opponents, the Holodomor you know, was using starvation as a way to kill people. And that's why uh, it can be and should be uh, called uh, uh, genocide. Uh, this was not by natural causes. I mean, that's been established beyond any uh, stretch of the imagination. Um, Amartya Sen, an expert uh, on uh, famine, puts the issue of killer famines succinctly when he writes, and I want to quote here, Starvation is a matter of some people not having enough food to eat, and not a matter of their being not enough food to eat. While the latter can be a cause of the former, it's clearly one of many possible influences. So in short, you know, Stalin and the Soviet and Ukrainian communists who accompanied him in, in this uh, effort took the food out of the Ukrainian peasantry's mouths, and they starved. And they were accorded no succor or, or relief. As we know, they were not allowed to seek uh, uh, food outside of Ukraine. They were not allowed, after a certain point, to travel to the cities to find something to eat. Stalin would not admit uh, that there was famine, uh, and he forbade any foreign relief. All of these aspects uh, of the Ukraine's uh, killer famine were, by the way, also characteristic of the Great Leap Forward and of Pol Pot's Cambodia. In all cases, right? No, they would not say there was a famine. They would blame it on the people involved. I mean, that's another common characteristic, and those Ukrainian peasants fought that there was, a, that there was famine. Um, and they would not allow them to leave, uh, uh, to go elsewhere to try to get something to eat. Now, fairly recently, um, I read three memoirs uh, about genocidal uh, starvation, all of which I can recommend to you uh, as, a, as a way to better understand the processes involved, you know, how it works, you know, what happens, um, and what is at stake. One is a diary uh, by, uh, uh, at that time, a boy named uh, David Sherkoviak, who died in the Wuj ghetto uh, of disease, various diseases associated with hunger. It's a quite wonderful, uh, um, uh, wonderful is not the right word, but the diary is very evocative of the time, and it's very kind of anti-Anne Frank. You know, Anne Frank talks about birds and trees and things like that, although she's obviously uh, on her way to death. This is a very bitter and angry uh, diary by a boy who is progressively uh, deprived of food in the ghetto. The second's a memoir by a woman named Long Um, uh, who managed to survive the Cambodian. Both of these are fairly recent, by the way. Uh, the, all of our freshmen read this uh, Long Um uh, diary who survived uh, the Cambodian catastrophe, though most of her family members died. Uh, and she came to the United States and subsequently became a, a writer. The third is a memoir actually recommended to me by Frank, which I had not read, I'm sorry to say, uh, the Miron Dolet, uh, Execution by Hunger, uh, Dolot. Uh, the book was published in 1985, it just hadn't crossed my screen, you know, many things when you're a scholar, don't cross your screen uh, if you don't pay attention. Anyway, it's a pseudonym for a, a Ukrainian boy uh, who experienced uh, the famine that fought in the war on the Soviet side, captured by the Germans, and managed to get out to the United States and ended up in California. <clears throat> he draws a terrifying picture of rural death in the Cherkasy County of uh, Ukraine. Uh, in 
If you read all three of these, uh, as I did, they have a haunting similarity to them. Right? How people cope with and suffer when confronted with the purposeful deprivation of food. The search for substitutes that sometimes poison and kill them. The changing body shapes, described by Sherikoviak as hourglass shapes. The same diseases, typhus, dysentery, diarrhea, and edema, which sees bodies swell up. I mean, I'm sure you've read about this as well. Bodies swell up uh, before death and ooze liquids. I mean, it's a terrifying and terrible uh, image of what happens to people in these cases. There's a debilitating weakness and subsequent listlessness. And there's severe challenges, as we know, uh, to, hung to family and morality. I must say, as I said, I've spent about now 15 years uh, uh, studying genocide. Of all the accounts of death uh, in genocide that I've read, death by starvation may be the most painful and heart uh, As I said, they're also interchangeable. Accounts of death by hunger, whether in Hitler's ghettos or Stalin's Ukrainian genocide, are numbing uh, in some ways in their similarity. Uh, the reports of people going mad with hunger, engaging in cannibalism, and nephrography, nephrography, I'm sorry, necrophagy, that is eating you know, dead people, uh, are common. Uh, because governments purposefully and forcibly, I mean, remember, forcibly deny relief. I mean, it's not just turning another cheek. They won't let people uh, um, get something to eat. Almost all hope is gone. And then you see the utter indifference of those who impose these conditions. Right? It seems almost impossible. I mean, it's something really worth registering and wondering about that people like Stalin and Kaganovich and Molotov and others in the case of the Ukrainian famine but also of Pol Pot and his, uh, uh, you know, comrades. And now, who we know was completely indifferent, couldn't have cared less, you know, about these tens of millions of people dying. I mean, it's really quite a, a striking phenomenon of human history, it seems to me. Okay, uh, five. Uh, the Holodomor highlights an important problem and a difficult problem in thinking about genocide in exclusively ethnic and national terms. And this gets to the definitional problems, but I, I won't go any deeper with that. We can, if you wish. As stipulated by the December 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which is, after all, the founding document of contemporary jurisprudence, both domestic and international, about uh, genocide. First of all, ethnic and national identity is often as elusive, you know, as class or political groupings. In other words, you know, most scholarship these days about an ethnicity talks about a constructed concept. Well, I don't believe it's a completely constructed concept, but still, uh, it's very difficult, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, identify someone by their ethnic group. And it's often, in any case, the perpetrators who end up doing the identification, not the people who are the, uh, the victims. Uh, secondly, uh, the Holodomor, many genocides, like the Holodomor, have mixed ethnic and class or political dimensions. In other words, you can't just say it was Ukrainians who died, and you can't just say it was peasants who died. They were Ukrainians peasants, and they were considered a political, social, and ethnic uh, uh, category combined. Uh, and finally, it just doesn't seem to me, and I've argued this elsewhere, and I'll be happy, you know, in this book, uh, Stalin's Genocides, go read it there. Um, uh, I, I just don't believe that ethnic and national categories alone should be the criteria of, of victim of victims in uh, genocide. It doesn't make sense to me. Let me just give you a couple of examples. 
uh, in the history of genocide. The Guatemalan military, as you may know, attacked Mayan Highlanders in the 1980s as alleged communists, as Indians, and as, as the lower class people uh, in the society. In other words, once again, a mixed category. Uh, a political category, a social category, and an ethnic category. I mean, to think about this issue of ethnicity, the Nazis killed mentally and physically handicapped children, uh, human beings, mostly children, all Germans. Right? They were killing Germans. Until, by the way, they were stopped by protests. Otherwise, they would have killed them all. And why wouldn't that, too, then, be a case uh, of genocide? You know, one of the questions I keep asking myself about the Cambodian genocide, which we call genocide, is the fact that many of the perpetrators who have been tried in Cambodia at this minute, at this time, not this minute, I don't know necessarily, but being tried over the past few years and now, are being indicted for genocide, but they're not being convicted of genocide because they only killed Cambodians. I mean, this one fellow who you may have, uh, have heard of, his name is Kang Guk Eve, known as Duch, was acquitted of all counts of genocide and received a reduced sentence to 16 years for lesser crimes against humanity because he only killed urban Cambodian intellectuals, which was a, a group of, uh, uh, of victims. He was the famous uh, prison camp man who was responsible, he was head of a prison camp who was responsible for the death of 16,000 people, torturing and killing 16,000 If he had killed Vietnamese and Ham people, as some Khmer Rouge did in very large numbers, then he could have been convicted of genocide, right? even though those numbers were much smaller. Of course, the Holodomor and the starvation of the Ukrainian peasantry was carried out in a larger context of an attack on the Ukrainian intelligentsia, Ukrainian language and culture. Uh, and in fact, we know that the abandonment of the Ukrainianization campaign, you know, the so-called indigenization campaign, you know, making Ukraine more Ukrainian, which took place in the 20s, that abandonment and indeed the pursuit then of the Ukrainian communists who, um, who uh, followed that campaign coincided with the, with the Holodomor. So some historians think the Holodomor then gave rise to the, to, the, to the persecution then of the Ukrainian nation as a whole. Because after all, the Ukrainian peasants and Ukrainians were liable for that famine. Right? I mean, they, they were the cause of it from Stalin's point of view. And some think that it went the other way. In other words, that the, that the attack on Ukrainians and Ukrainian culture, then the Holodomor came as, as a byproduct of that. In any case, again, they take place at the same time. Uh, and people are killed uh, in large numbers. The Holodomor, from my perspective, and the more I read about it, seems almost like one of these perfect storms, you know, of Stalinist nationalist and peasant policies. They can't handle the, the, the notion that there can be an independent nation, a nation that, that follows its own, you know, cultural will. And you can't abide the peasants, can't abide the peasants, especially peasants who resist collectivization and who, you know, don't like the forcible delivery of grain. So you get these things together in 1932, 93, uh, 30, 32, 33, and, uh, and ends up being an attack of a genocidal nature. 1938 alone, I mean, many were killed, many Ukrainian intellectuals and leaders were killed already in uh, 33. Uh, you know, at the uh, time of the Holodomor, but then later as well, in 38, uh, 185,000 Ukrainians were shot, leaders were shot, intelligentsia were shot, another 250,000 or so were deported to the Gulag. Six, um, you know, I'm gonna go through this one more quickly. This is the question of the number who died as a, as a consequence of the Holodomor. And this is, you know, it, this remains controversial, although the range, as Frank has indicated, has narrowed. 
considerably. Um, you know, in, in my book, I talked about three to five million. You know, people suggest that if you use the number five million or more, you're exaggerating the numbers. And the truth is that in most cases of genocide, peoples will all, people will often um, uh, especially if they're developing national consciousness or they're working on, on getting their genocide recognized, you see routinely the numbers are exaggerated. Right? But what people don't mention, and what I notice in reading about Holodomor, is that people will also purposefully underestimate numbers. They'll keep them low. Scholars in particular don't want to be accused of exaggerating the numbers of people killed. And from my point of view, these NKDD numbers that are used to come up, and Frank talked about uh, census numbers, you can use those too. But how can you, I still have a lot of trouble believing Soviet census numbers, right? I mean, do you believe Soviet production figures? No, right? Nobody believes those figures. So how can you believe census figures? And, you know, all numbers, we know all numbers in the Soviet Union are purposefully, even those that are done secretly, are purposefully done for, for a concrete goal, you know, to convince somebody of something that they have no inherent value as objective numbers. So, um, you know, one of the things I, I sort of conclude in my work is, first of all, you know, be suspicious of the numbers. But even though I say three to five million, when, when some people will now use the three million figure as a way not to get into trouble, you know, and not to be accused of exaggerating the number used, a uh, number uh, suggested, um, y you know, that that's equally a fallacy as exaggerating the numbers. So let me, do, let me just leave it at that. We can come back to that if, if you wish. So finally, seven, see, I got through them all. Crucial to genocide as a whole and to an analyzing the whole of the more is a case of genocide. <coughs> is the question of intent, right? And here the international courts, because the Genocide Convention and the courts talk about intent as an important part of genocide. You know, people can't just die. It has to be Stalin and the Soviet government, in the case of Holodomor, have to intend that these Ukrainians die. You know, the, the Russian argument, and many of the Russian Publications these days will say, well, yes, there was a famine all over, and it's too bad Ukrainians died. It's sort of like the Turks will say, you know, uh, it was a tough time during the war, you know, when the Armenians uh, died. Uh, we're sorry that so many died, but everybody died. You know? I mean, Turks died and others died, as well as the Armenians. Um, and the Russians will also say, well, you know, Russians died in large numbers too, and it's true. And in Kazakhstan, there was a terrible famine, many Kazakhs, and in fact, percentage-wise, more Kazakhs uh, died. So the question of intent, did Stalin intend to kill Ukrainians? Okay. Well, a couple of parts of this argument I want to emphasize and talk about. First of all, it seems to me there's a growing body of evidence that does indeed indicate that Stalin intended for Ukrainian peasants in the countryside to die. Most of it is anecdotal. Most of it is anecdotal, but there are many of them, <laughs> right? And they add up uh, to more uh, than uh, just a single anecdote. I mean, it's pretty convincing that Stalin was ready to see the Ukrainians killed. But the second important thing to understand, and this has to do with the international courts and how they think about genocide. Now, some historians don't want to deal with legal scholars. I mean, they think the law and lawyers and legal scholars should be avoided completely in this. And I think that's a terrible mistake. I mean, these legal scholars have done a ton of work on many of these cases of genocide, not unfortunately on the Holodomor, but on Bosnia and on Rwanda and on Sierra Leone and on other cases, right, that are, that are current. In these cases, the international lawyers come to the conclusion that you don't necessarily have to prove that the leader, you don't have to establish the chain of command. Stalin doesn't have to say to Kadanovich, go kill Ukrainians. Kadanovich doesn't have to say to the local leaders uh, in Ukraine, kill, you know, your people. The local leaders don't have to say to the local party people, you know, starve them to death. 
for there to be genocide. That the act itself can define intent. And therefore, you know, in my view, this act shows the events themselves indicate that this was genocide and that Stalin's responsibility for them uh, is irrefutable. Thank you, Frank. And uh, we'll open now uh, the floor for discussion. Uh, we have a mic uh, in the middle of the room. If you are here close, please. Why don't you the mic to the mic to the mic so people can hear? Oh. Or you could just come oh. My concern is mainly for the uh, uh, census that was done in that time frame or after that. Why were seven or five people who were in charge of census executed? Were they executed because the number of death was low or was too high? Any reasonable people can make that conclusion that the census was too high, that's why they were executed. Okay, so, the, so I think we're referring to the 1937 census as opposed to the 39 census. Uh, and the statistics did not come out the way the Soviets wanted them. Uh, uh, and uh, because, as I understood it, because the number they thought was too low for what Stalin wanted as a figure at that point, and then people, the census is suppressed. And this was the missing data we long had. That is, people were dealing with the 39 census always. And, and the 39 census, something was, it didn't fit. And now we have a better, better indication, although I agree with Norman in many ways on the problem of, of Soviet census, tensai. And we now have more data than we had before in that we also now have records of death, but these are very tricky as well. I mean, if you go back to the Black Keys of the Kremlin, they would tell you about how people would classify deaths. You know, you were to die of diseases. Uh, the doctor, the Jewish doctor I mentioned who saved people, how did he save people? He had to classify they had another disease. So if you declared that someone had a heart condition or cancer, you could take them into the hospital and feed them. But if they were starving to death, you were not allowed to feed them. And, and so if, when you consider this world now, if you're going to take those hospitals record, that hospital's record, and I don't know if they exist, you can imagine the data you're going to get on how many people are dying of heart conditions you know, in that hospital who he couldn't save. So this shows us that we will always, I think, have great problems. Now they are making, uh, uh, I mean, there are, there are specialists in demography. Demography is a difficult science to say, at least in the best of times, terms. Uh, there is constant debate that goes on, uh, on on this, but we are at least, when we're coming to, to a better guess, at least. Uh, one, I am, of course, struck that the people who were guessing without really much data are not so far away from what we're now coming up with. Uh, so uh, so uh, on the one hand, that doesn't mean it isn't worthwhile to do all these others, but we have sporadic data from some areas and not others. There is a project at Harvard now which is trying to put in all this data in a GIS mapping project. And I think one of the most interesting parts of, of their finding is that the, the worst level of death did not occur in the region we always thought it did. It was always assumed that the grain-growing regions of southern Ukraine would be in the worst position because once you took away the grain and you live in a dry steppe area, you have virtually no possible foodstuffs. And the closer you come to the forest steppe and forest region, the more chances mushrooms, metals, all these things save you. And also, you have more likely to have livestock. And, if you, and, and that's, by the way, if you read the, the uh, diverse accounts, they're telling you if anybody had a goat, they had a chance of, of living. If they could somehow hide that goat and, and the goat, you know, that's how people survive. What they found now with the Harvard Project is that it doesn't work that way. That the highest death areas were the areas of the forest steppe. And that's, in those days, these were the provinces of Kharkiv and Keiyu had the highest amount of deaths. The step lower, because there the Soviet authorities then put back in some help because they wanted it then later, once this was over, to be a grain-growing region again. 
you know, so help was administered, and we have to deal with the help issue. This becomes very controversial. I'll end this too long discussion because the help issue is, is very interesting because, of course, the help was administered selectively. So the old accounts that there were people in our village who were being fed, which many people dismissed as sort of fantasy, hatred of neighbors, we now know a lot more that the, 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 the crucial people for the Soviet economy and the crucial people in the party were going to get their food to, in certain areas. Certain areas it went entirely wrong and everybody dies, but if they could, they were, so that you actually were determining who would die in that race, and it looks like the Kiev and the 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 uh, the uh, Kharkiv region will figure out. I might also add this for the demography of the ethnicity of the famine is also an important issue because these were the areas of the highest percentage of Ukrainian population. The further you went south in Ukraine, the more mixed the population was. I don't necessarily say you know, I don't connect this as a reason, but the effect was that Ukrainians were more likely to die because the, the areas with the highest Ukrainian populations were the areas that were the famine is the worst. I think you can hear me whether it's on or not. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you both. Actually, the, I'd be interested to hear responses from both folks, but I think it's particularly directed at something Professor Neymark was talking about. Um, so this idea that um, Maybe we don't need to think of um, ethnic or national categories or a, as some sort of qualifying definition of what constitutes a genocide and, or not. And I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on that specifically as relates to the question of intent. So if, um, in taking the Holodomor case in, in particular, uh, does it become across the board any more or less difficult to prove intent um, if we're no longer trying to specify that this is an anti-Ukrainian crime as opposed to against a class group, the peasantry or something like that. So are those two related? If a broader definition, we don't necessarily have to prove that it's uh, ethnic or national in its, in its intent. Uh, how does that change the sort of quest for intent as, as part of the category? Uh, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good question. And, um, you know, the, I mean, every, everyone points to the Holocaust is sort of the easy case, right? I mean, and as um, because there, you know, Jews are Jews, and even those Jews who don't think they're Jews and are identified by the perpetrators as Jews become Jews, right? And so the perpetrator then has the intent and says, "I'm going to kill all the Jews," right? Or in some fashion, uh, you know, makes it clear that they will die or they will be destroyed, right? And that makes things easy. Um, or easier, but in, the, but in these other cases, as I'm trying to indicate, in many other cases, and even in the case uh, of the Armenian genocide for a number of different reasons, but some Armenians you know, didn't have to suffer or didn't necessarily suffer because they were Armenian, were located in certain kinds of, uh, of, pl of places. Um, these mixed categories dominate the uh, history of genocide. Right? So intent, then, uh, is probably harder to prove. I mean, it's a good point. The intent is harder to prove if you don't say, well, let, all right, let's take Rwanda, all right? We're going to kill all the Tutsis. But we know that Tutsis is not a really decent category of who was whom. Nobody, many people thought of themselves as mixed. Some, peop, some Hutus were killed and identified as Tutsis because they lived in uh, in uh, Tutsi villages. Um, people imagine, you know, that they were Tutsis. So, so maybe it's easier to demonstrate intent, even though a lot of the people who were killed were not, you know, that there's no one-to-one -one relationship between who they intended to kill and who they killed. In the case of the Holodomor, and in some of these other cases I was talking about, I talked about the Guatemalan case in particular, these are mixed categories. I wouldn't take Ukrainian out of the category. I mean, when I try to, you know, when we, Frank and I have been to a couple of conferences together, when I, when, I, when I talk about this, some Ukrainians get annoyed with me because they think that's what I'm doing. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm trying to say is, they weren't just trying to kill Ukrainians. I mean, if it was just Ukrainians, right, then there would be people in the cities who would be killed, and there would be people in Russia who were of Ukrainian background who would be attacked. Right? 
So it's a, it's a category of Ukrainians mixed and blended, you know, with peasantry, but also with a certain peasantry that you know has a has a reputation for holding you know a kind of Ukrainian national consciousness, you know, that they go after, and that you're right. I mean, it makes it more difficult to identify intent, but it doesn't mean that there's no intent. And I would say the same thing with the Mayans in the, in the Guatemala case, where it's quite clear that some people think they're killing communists, some people, it's a mixed category that they're killing. Many of them are not communists at all. And I think the civic and ethnic national binary divide is always very dangerous. It gets us into a lot of difficulties, but I think in certain ways we can also re-employ this for some of this discussion. There is the issue of Ukrainians, and then the issues like the Kuban comes into effect in various ways. There is also the issue of Ukraine. That is, if one of Stalin's problems, and you know, we can't read into his mind, is Ukraine as a political entity, a political nation in a certain way, but let's say the, what's going on in the Ukrainian Republic, uh, Professor Kulchitsky, who is one of the major, uh, formerly Soviet, now Ukrainian historians of this field, emphasizes this as, as the intentionality, the intentionality of bringing Ukraine to its knees, and in that sense, the entire population. But the reason Ukraine was to be brought to its knees was because of the national communists who were leading Ukraine. So that, that in that case, weakening the entire population. And of course, the reason one could argue this has always been, for example, the, the central agricultural region of Russia does not suffer to this degree. I mean, it's not just an issue of grain growing regions in South, it's a very complicated issue. But that, that one argument, which then mixes both Ukraine, Ukrainian, Ukraine as a political category of, of the Republic of Ukraine, and then the, the issue of ethnicity, I think, is, is one that can be explored on. I asked Roy, uh, just uh, to uh, just a second, uh, uh, follow up uh, with your comments. Uh, we assume here that we call this uh, panel uh, the Ukrainian family. But in Ukraine itself, very often there are debates. Is it a, indeed a national story? Uh, when you go to Ukraine, I travel very often there. Most of the memorials are in the in the Western uh, Ukraine, and that is, uh, I would say. M much more uh, visible, much uh, more than uh, in other regions, and but there was no famine there. In the east, uh, which uh, what you call this, the rest of Ukraine, East Central Ukraine, which suffered most, it is much more debatable. Can it turn into indeed a national uh, agenda and a national uh, pillar <laughs> of Ukrainian identity when the debates are so? And I have in mind several. Uh, I'm working now on. Uh, former gangsters, also known as the KGB. And uh, very often when I interview people who come from the East, uh, they refer to this, yes, it was a crime, crime against humanity, etc. but this is a Western business. Okay, so yes, I, and this brings us to the issue of current political debates. So I think it's a yes, nice, exactly. nice transfer into this issue. Uh, on the monuments issue, we've had the monuments mapped out. They're overwhelmingly in central Ukraine. They're overwhelmingly in the areas of the Kiev, uh, Kiev. Oh, oh, Kiev yeah. Oblast, yeah. right. All right, so it's, they're not in Western, they're, they're not in pre-1939 Ukraine that was not affected by the famine. Overwhelmingly village monuments are in areas uh, uh, where the famine did occur. Uh, now, that's the issue of just the monuments. And, and we, a lot of work is being done now on the monuments as they're being put out. And what is quite stunning is, for example, compared even to Kuban, and absolutely compared to certain areas of Russia affected by the famine, like the Volga, there are almost no rural monuments. The total difference between central Ukraine and those areas. Uh, now a reasonable number in the south of Ukraine are appearing as well. So that's the issue of monuments. Then the issue of, of memory uh, and, and the famine is an issue. Uh, so it's been an interesting development. One of the, the most contentious of these issues was was the, the vision that the, the diaspora, Ukrainians outside of Ukraine, had of the famine imported in the late 1980s and early 1990s into Ukraine? And to a great degree, yes. That is, the, uh, 
the the timing of when this this issue occurred is is questionable. As I tried to show, it really arose in 1934-5 already, and it arose particularly in the circles of the Eastern Ukrainian emigration, the Fedora emigration. It was not really the, the Galicians joined it, but it's being led by Eastern Ukrainians who now see what's going on beyond the border. So that's where this kind of interpreted. Now, of course, you have no possibility of a comparable interpretation inside the Soviet Union. You couldn't mention the word Poland, so you couldn't have an interpretation. Then the next set of this comes with these groups of the Black Bees of the Kremlin, overwhelmingly refugees from the famine areas, not Western Ukrainians. They form this vision that I then presented with these volumes comes, not, not from Western <coughs> Ukrainians from them. But they are indeed people outside of Ukraine who are doing it, so in that sense, although they are Eastern, Eastern Ukrainians, East and West here means pre-1939 Soviet Union or outside the Soviet Union as much of the much of the Ukrainian ethnic territory was. So that would be, I think, the status at that point. I think in the late 1980s, the dynamic was very different from what it is today because of the, the uh, living of uh, a large number of survivors. That is, when the late 1980s came, you could easily go back, and it was largely urban youth going back to grandmothers and villages and saying, this unheard of, this is a ridiculous thing, and the grandmother saying, well, what do you mean? Of course it happened. You know, so this was a, a major teaching thing. When the recent, the, the issue of what degree is the, is the whole of the more viewed as a genocide comes up now, there has been a shift in opinion in Ukraine to now about 60% say yes. What is most stunning is 76% in the rural areas say yes, right? So it's the reverse of what you usually assume in most, uh, most analysis of the Soviet Union. It is assumed that urban elites create ideas, ideas come from cities, villages are, are places of people who are intellectually dead and have that. In this one case, uh, there seems to be an issue of actual physical memory. And a, a large degree is being played as well by the churches who go to the, because people know where the graves are, right? And, and they go and, and establish these monuments on this. The other thing that I would say is you said East. Of course, there's a great difference between Donbass, uh, the south of Ukraine, central Ukraine, the, the Kharkiv region, and the Kiev area, and, uh, and Vinnytsia, an area that you know well, right? These areas are very different in how they, how, how they relate to historical circumstances. Now, the reason it becomes a political issue is as well uh, uh, the issue of various regimes in Ukraine espousing issues. That is, the, the Yushchenko uh, government saying that this is a genocide, we're gonna make a law that it was a genocide. Yanukovych, comes to power, goes, goes to Brussels and say, it wasn't a genocide to police Putin. But what has happened is uh, public opinion, from all we can tell, has shifted quite markedly and markedly in those areas of Ukraine, with the only holdouts being, of course, Crimea, which was not part of, which Crimea was not part of Ukraine during, during this period anyway. And the population in Crimea didn't live in Crimea largely at this point. They are, they're mostly immigrants in from southern places. And of course, Donbass in that issue, and that's that's as much as I can you know we know at the, uh, at the moment on those things. My name is Nona, and I'm either here or there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nancy. My name is Nona and I'm just from Kubai. When I was a when I was a um, freshman at Kuban State University, I collected a a series of interview in Kuban Stanitsas, and they would uh, tell me exactly the stories uh, uh, um, described here and here. And uh, but the thing is, they remember all this cannibalism and all this 
horrifying details uh, very well, uh, but nobody speaks about <coughs> genocide. There is no uh, discourse of genocide in Kuban region. Uh, can, can this is to either of presenters. Can it be uh, proved that the idea of Holodomor as a genocide is a uh, later construction? Thank you. So, of course, uh, I mean, the, the right answer is of course, right? In other words, genocide as a concept was not even there until 1944, when Raphael Lemkin wrote his famous book about the Axis occupation of Europe, and he coined the term genocide, right, 1944. Um, and then, um, you know, there was a convention, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, on the uh, prevention and punishment of genocide in December of 1948. But I think we all need to remember that for a very long time, no one paid much attention to the word genocide or the concept of genocide. And when they did, it was mostly from the 60s onward in conjunction with the Holocaust. So for a long time, I mean easily for 20, 25 years, even after people began to speak about genocide, um, uh, it was not kosher, maybe the right word, to, to think about any other case of mass killing as genocide. It's only really uh, with, you know, the Bosnia, Rwanda, the courts um, that are talking about genocide that much of this, I mean, there was a kind of genocide studies in the 1980s that, that got going and started to talk about, you know, you really need to compare First, you know, the Armenian genocide was sort of allowed in the circle of genocide. One more comment about this, I mean, this could be a very long answer, but one more comment about this is that Lemkin himself, interestingly enough, had a very broad view of genocide. You know, one that included many other cases, and one that went back in history. And if you read the Genocide Convention, the Genocide Convention says this is something that's happened in all times and all places, in other words, it didn't make it exclusively about what happened in World War II. So, yeah, you know, the, the situation in Kuban today, I mean, it, uh, Frank may uh, know, be know better than I uh, why they don't use the, the term genocide, but it could just be that they're out of touch. Um, also, um, you know, Russians don't like that term at all. Uh, so, you know, um, they may not you know, it may be politically incorrect, you know, to use to use the term, and you know, people don't don't talk about it, basically. So th that would be my uh, that would be my answer. That for, you know, it, it it is an anachronistic term, but a lot of things are anachronistic terms. You know, and I think when Lemkin came up with this term genocide uh, in in forty uh, four, and then became a lobbyist for the term. You know, he was very important in bringing it to the UN and to, and, and to common use. And by the way, he then at one point gave a speech, uh, was it 52 or so, yeah. about, about uh, Ukraine, uh, Holodomor, as genocide, right? Uh, it's not a particularly good speech, but it's a speech, right? Um, uh, um, you know, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't taken in by people. Not just in Kuban, but here. Right? If I could say, one is the term, the word, which is, is in all respects to Norman who writes on it, in a certain way getting in the way of us really dealing with issues, that it becomes the litmus test of all decisions. The other is what might be called national or cultural interpretation. That is, if we drop the word genocide, and if you go to a stanetsha and you say, who did they aim? Was it aimed against anyone? Was it aimed against Cossacks? Was it aimed against us kind of people, by them, whoever the days are? What were they trying to do? If you go to the famous Poltavska Stanecha, right, that is so decimated, 
And, it, and, and what I think is if you move away then from just the, this word gender, which is of course a word coming in from outside, or is it it or, or isn't it? But, but are there the elements of that discussion in it? And then of course, Kuban, the issue become, because of course, it, the, the whole national interpretation in Ukraine in some ways of the genocide comes from the decision to stop the Ukrainianization in Kuban, right? To declare suddenly the Ukrainian speaking <coughs> population, whatever their national conscious was of Kuban, which was 30, 40%, let's say, of the Kuban population, to suddenly declare them Russians. Right, so they changed their nationality at that point. Now, uh, those very people now have, at some level, a Russian identity. They still have a Kuba. I, you can tell me, I shouldn't tell you. you. You've done the research. You know all of these identity issues. So I will, will go on with that. But of course, if they then, how can they have a national interpretation? Because it then gives up their names as Russians. Then they're, then they're disloyal Russians. And they're living in Russia. They're not living in Ukraine. So I think it's very hard. And in the same way, when the Kuban choirs come to, to Ukraine and say, now we'll sing you a, a Kuban folk song, Shchena Merlo Ukraina. You know, and I've heard this sung by a Kuban choir as a Kuban folk song. Well, you know, uh, they, they of course at that level have, have identity. But I think it would be very interesting if you, and I, I don't know if you'll ever have the opportunity, but just on the various questions of you know, why, what is their explanation of genesis, genesis and intent? It won't tell us what really these party people were doing. And what we can tell from the documents is they decide the Ukrainianization is very dangerous to them in Kuban. They stop it. They at the same time are treating Kuban in worse ways than, than they are any place else in Russia, right? Is, is Kuban is, is, is singled out at that point. And you know, how you can put it all together is different. So I'm really intrigued at the aftermath of genocide and famine. I like Norman's really uh, interesting comparative focus here on kinds of genocide. So my question really is, um, or different instances of genocide, my question is, um, what you know, does genocide work for the intent that the killers had? That is, did Stalin accomplish what he wanted by doing this famine? Or do they ever really work in the circumstances that you've studied? And more to the specific Ukrainian instance, I'm wondering in the next several years, can you tell us a bit more about what, you know, isn't the economy devastated? Is there a huge labor shortage? The agriculture must have fallen apart? You know, what, what you know, what's the aftermath of this sort of effort? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, and there are a lot of levels of answer, I think. Uh, one of the levels of answer is, yes, it did accomplish uh, you know, the ends of destroying, in some ways, the ability of Ukrainians to act as a unit to resist, in any way, Moscow's, um, Moscow's wishes. And, you know, and it continued, in some senses, through this shooting of Ukrainian leaders, the deportation of Ukrainians and importation of labor from elsewhere in the Soviet Union, in other words, to take the place of the Ukrainian peasants, because they needed those they needed those farms and they needed those kolkhozy uh, to work. You know, they needed they needed the better grain thing, and they they let off on some of the, the requisitioning policies. Um, you know, at, at the end of 1933, as a way to get the economy going again, and it did get going again. But the, you know, in some ways, the back was broken. And, and think about it. I mean, you know, not, I mean, did it work in in Nazi Germany? Yeah. I mean, the Germans got rid of the Jews, right? And uh, did it work? And did it work in the case of the Armenians? You know, you know, there are very few Armenians left. On that level, it works. I mean, I'm going to suggest on another level, genocide doesn't work. Right? Uh, it doesn't work because people don't forget. I mean, that's the interesting part of it. You know, as much as, I mean, it's true, as, you know, as Frank has shown, that people, you know, in Canada, and a few people published some things and said, yeah, there was this terrible thing that happened, but the vast majority of people, you know, had no real consciousness of what happened in Ukraine until other things had changed, right? Until other things had happened. And then, not just us, but Ukrainians now, you know, are pushing this, pushing this battle themselves. And you can bet, 
than what's going on today, you know, between Kiev and Moscow. You know, that this is part of that memory. So in some senses, you know, the, the thrust that I, you know, I, I'm going to make a terrible generality and I don't really know enough to say it, but I think it works, that it fits in, you know, to the, um, you know, to the, to the desire of Ukrainians to say, we don't want these Moscow anymore. You know, we don't want these Russians. And it's part of the deal. And if you, if you look at other, other genocides as well, I mean, look, look at the case of the Armenians where it's been very, very powerful and how, how, how it's disturbed the Turkish Republic in some ways and made it things much more difficult for the Turks in all kinds of ways, you know, to become part of the European Union, certainly, you know, to, to, to pose in the international community as a tolerant and diverse and, and democratic organization. So if things catch up with you, the same thing with the Jews and the Germans. I mean, uh, you know, the Jews have extracted a lot, I mean, uh, from, uh, from the Germans, and the Germans are constantly, I mean, part of their national identity is wrapped up in having killed the Jews, you know, having been the cause of the Holocaust. So, you know, these things, interestingly enough, I mean, and powerfully enough, don't go away. Genocide doesn't go away. And it's what makes it such a, you know, such a forceful uh, part of human history. You know, on the more on the on the on the more immediate level, right? I mean, the Ukrainianization campaign was completely about, and that wasn't completely uh, done away with. There was a kind of small Ukrainianization, a re-Ukrainianization re campaign that went on in the '30s where they couldn't completely get rid of all Ukrainians, right, in leadership positions and things like that, and just simply take it over uh, from Russia. But it was a kind of recasting of what Ukraine was. Right? And that recasting, in some ways, I think, worked reasonably well in the short term. But I would say, just on uh, not the issues does it work, but if we just look at what happened, why these things have gone. So two things I can see definitely, one, it changed the demographic balance of Ukraine. We know that a relatively high birth rate in the 1920s in the rural areas, increasing number of, of Ukrainian speakers, that is from, as their native language was going on. Uh, if this had continued on in the 1930s, Stalin himself had said the cities may become Ukrainian, this might have happened. There would have been problems with Ukrainianization, other such groups, but just if the villages were relatively thriving, and producing all of these this excess population, they would have moved in, in into the city. So in that way, there would have been a change change of the demographic balance of Ukraine. And then above all, there was the the ideological balance. As everything Ukrainian was then associated with the village, and the village was the scene of this death that people moved to the cities from. You know, we cannot recreate the psychological network of all of those people, the people that do move to the city. Well, who are these survivors? They, they go to the Donbass, they go somewhere else, they get, get, and they've left, and they left death, and they also, also frequently, if you want to look at it, got out because they finally had to turn their back on somebody else and leave. You know, how, we, we know the story tends to get written of the people who go back to try and save mother. What about the people who leave and run and, and get new docking. Well, that creates the urban new groups of Ukraine, you know, who then adopt Russian as a, or Surjik largely as their language and then want to cut off from this way. So, and we have one laboratory, we have civic society that develops in Austria, Hungary, in Western Ukrainian areas, and we see villages that change. Well, I think that was exactly what was going on in the 1920s, now, and that's what Stalin stopped. And so in that sense, yes, there were many Many successes. What, what really makes it difficult is, of course, World War II. We, we don't have the direct. We, we learned about the Armenians immediately after the genocide. They arrive in the West, they tell us what was going on. We know about the Holocaust immediately after World War II. This one, because when we get the evidence, we have so many other events between them that it's very hard to sift this out now. Or I was just going to ask, uh, didn't Hitler identify the genocide of the Cherokee uh, in the 30s? I think he blamed America and said that it would be uh, similar to the 
what we did to the well, he Native American. He didn't call it genocide. There was no word genocide, remember, until 1944. Yeah. So what he said was, I think when he was looking east, he said, you know, we'll do uh, to the natives of uh, these plains to the east, meaning Russians and Ukrainians mostly, but Russians as we had in mind what the Americans did to the Native Americans. He didn't talk about the Cherokees. And who remembers the Armenians? That's well, he said, who remembers the Armenians now? But that was actually about the Poles, right? He was about to attack Poland, and he was telling his generals, um, you know, when you attack, you destroy. And, and then he said, and who remembers the Armenians now? I mean, the other thing about that, by the way, is the Cherokees were not subjected to genocide. They were, they, they let, they were booted off on the Trail of Tears. It was a terrible, I mean, many died, but it was not a, it was not an intentional campaign of mass killing, which I think is what, what genocide is. And then maybe some American tribes were, not not Cherokees. And on this issue of the dating of things, in 1933, Dmitry Levitsky and the Polish saying the Ukrainian delegate gets up and discusses the famine in terms of the Armenians. Because I was looking for the I did a talk for the Armenians on how early this is that they get identified. It's already 1933, the first identification. You mentioned the concentration of different population and nationalities in Ukraine. During that time, the cities were primarily Russian, and they never had any famine. They were surrounded, and the people who starved could not even reach into the cities. So that proves again that discrimination and genocide was intended for Ukrainians and not for Russians. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it is true, but it doesn't prove it. That is, what we know is that the cities were going to be given a certain level, and not all cities, by the way. It depended how well they fit in the Soviet economic plan. Certain cities were going to get, get support in if they fit the Soviet economic plan. And that the city population was a much lower percentage of Ukrainians, and of course that the communists were based in the cities and then in the areas of, of the Donbass. So all of those elements are true. The effect is true, but, but that's not necessarily the next step of the proof of it. And I might add, one of the real areas that people are working on now are the small towns. That is where these structures broke down. And that involved lots of areas in the right bank of Ukraine where small towns were not so much Russian, but Jewish, Polish, and other such groups, and there are many areas there where the support doesn't come because they're useless economically. I mean, it, there was an economic structure they're trying to save. It's part of the brutality of this system. And in fact, there are many parallels you can do with the Nazis, you know, on e Nazi economic policies and how they treat various groups and why they let certain groups do certain things, and the way the Soviets do these things. So, all, you know, I think there are many complexities of it, and of course the questions are who are the days. There are many days in this whole story. Okay. Before thanking our speakers, I would like to thank first of all the organizers, the Center of Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies, Pavel Levy and Johanna Knesevich, and thanks to both our speakers, Frank Sissin and Norman Neymar, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.